Chapter sixty four of a book of discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A book of discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter sixty four. Livingstone traces Lake Shirva and Nyessa. Burton and Speke had not yet returned from Central Africa when Livingstone left England on another expedition into the interior, with orders to extend the knowledge already attained of the geography of eastern and central Africa, and to encourage trade. Leaving England on 10th of March, 1858, he reached the east coast the following May, as British Consul of Quilimane, the region which lies about the mouth of the Zambezi. Livingstone had brought out with him a small steam lounge called by the natives the Ma Robert, after Mrs. Livingstone, the mother of Robert, their eldest child. In this little steam lounge he made his way up the Shire River, which flows into the Zambezi quite near its mouth. The delight of threading out the meanderings of upwards of two hundred miles of a hitherto unexplored river must be felt to be appreciated says Livingstone in his diary. At the end of this two hundred miles, further progress became impossible, because of rapids, which no boat could pass. These magnificent cataracts we called the Merchantson Cataracts, after one whose name has already a worldwide fame, says Livingstone. Leaving their boat here, they started on foot for the great lake described by the natives. It took them a month of hard travelling to reach their goal. Their way lay over the native tracks which run as a network over this part of the world. They are veritable footpaths, never over a foot in breadth, beaten as hard as adamant by centuries of native traffic. Like the roads of the old Romans, they run straight on, over everything, ridge and mountain and valley. On 18th April, Lake Shirva came into sight. A considerable body of bitter water containing leeches, fish, crocodiles, and hippopotami. The country around is very beautiful, adds Livingstone, enclosed with rich vegetation, and the waves breaking and foaming over a rock added to the beauty of the picture. Exceedingly lofty mountains stand near the eastern shore. No white man had gazed at the lake before. Though one of the smaller African lakes, Shirva is probably larger than all the lakes of Great Britain put together. Returning to Tete, the explorer now prepared for his journey for the farther lake Nyasa. This was to be no new discovery. The Portuguese knew the locality of Lake Shirva, and at the beginning of the 17th century Nyasa was familiar to them under another name. Landing at the same spot on the Shire banks as before, Livingstone with thirty-six Makololo porters and two native guides, ascended the beautiful Shire Highlands, some twelve hundred feet above sea level, and crossed the range on which Zomba, the residence of the British commissioner of Nyasa land, now stands. When within a day's march of their goal, they were told that no lake had ever been heard of in the neighborhood. But, said the natives, the river Shire stretched on, and it would take two months to reach the end, which came out of perpendicular rocks which towered almost to the skies. Let us go back to the ship, said the followers. It is no use trying to find the lake. But Livingstone persevered, and he was soon rewarded by finding a sheet of water, which was indeed the beginning of Lake Nyasa. It was 16 September, 1856. How far is it to the end of the lake? he asked. The other end of the lake? Who ever heard of such a thing? Why, if one started when a mere boy to walk to the other end of the lake, he would be an old grey-headed man before he got there, declared one of the natives. Livingstone knew that he had opened up a great waterway to the interior of Africa, but the slave trade in these parts was terrible, gangs being employed in carrying the ivory from countries to the north down to the east coast. The English explorer saw that if he could establish a steamer upon this Lake Nyasa, 
and buy ivory from the natives with our European goods, he would at once strike a deadly blow at the slave trade. His letters home stirred several missionaries to come out and establish a settlement on the banks of the Shire River. Bishop Mackenzie and a little band of helpers arrived on the River Shire two years later, and in 1862 Mrs. Livingstone joined them, bringing out with her a little new steamer to launch on the Lake Nyassa. But the unhealthy season was at its height, and the surrounding low land, rank with vegetation, and reeking from the late rainy season, exhaled the malarious poison in enormous quantities. Mrs. Livingstone fell ill, and in a week she was dead. She was buried under a large baobab tree at Shapunga, where her grave is visited by many a traveller passing through this once solitary region, first penetrated by her husband. The blow was a crushing one for Livingstone, and for a time he was quite bewildered. But when his old energy returned, he superintended the launching of the little steamer, the Lady Nyassa. But disappointment and failure awaited him, and at last, just two years after the death of his wife, he took the Lady Nyassa to Zanzibar by the Rovuma River, and set forth to reach Bombay, where he hoped to sell her, for his funds were low. On the last day of April, 1864, he started on his perilous journey. Though warned that the monsoon would shortly break, he would not be deterred. And after sailing 2,500 miles in the little boat, built only for river and lake, a forest of masts one day loomed through the haze in Bombay Harbor, and he was safe. After a brief stay here, Livingstone left his little lounge and made his way to England on a mail packet. But no one realized at this time the importance of his new discoveries. No one foresaw the value of Nyasa land, now under British protectorate. Livingstone had brought to light a lake, 1,570 feet above the sea, 350 miles long and 40 broad up and down which British steamers make their way to-day, while the long range of mountains lining the eastern bank, known as the Livingstone Range, testified to the fact that he had done much, even if he might have done more. End of chapter 64